Welcome to How to Yu-Gi-Oh! Historic Set Clash of Rebellions Okay, so this is a set that's really quite important for Yu-Gi-Oh! history. This is the set that introduces Tier Zero as we know it. Have we had Tier Zero before in Yu-Gi-Oh? I believe the answer that you are looking for is yes. I would say yes, when the game first started, you know, with our first banning of uh, Chaos Emperor, that original effect. But I feel it is this set, the release date of August 6, 2015, with the release of Performage Monsters, that really introduced to us what Tier Zero is in Yu-Gi-Oh!, what it means, and how it affects the game in such a fundamental way. And that is really important to realize. It is because of Performages that, that premiered in this set that the concept of Tier Zero was created by us as players and by Konami in general. So that's a very important point to realize. And also to understand that this set introduces not just Performages, but Aroma, Kaiju, Cosmos, Draco Slayer, and Ignites. And also, fun fact, this year we also see the release of, of a future of uh, more support of Purple Mages. Uh, we get to see some of the support that was exclusive to the Arc V anime come into the real life in OCG. When we're going to get that in TCG, we do not know. Poss maybe next year, who knows? Maybe we'll get it then, or maybe we'll get it in a future set this year. We, 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 we don't know at this point. Uh, maybe it'll be in Rage of Abyss, the set after Infinite Forbidden. Who knows? But that's all I've got to say at this point. So let's continue with the rest of this set. And um... Okay, so let's start with the legacy support. We have Archfiend, Cyber, Cyber Dragon, DDD, Falafel, Infernoid, Gem Knight, Magician, Melodious, Odd Eyes, Performer Pal, Raid Raptor, Rank Up Magic, Red Eyes, and Toons. The wild cards in this set are Retaliating Sea, Chicken Game, and Wavering Eyes. Chicken Game premiering in this set was one of those cards that was truly and utterly wild. Um, later on, it would get uh, banned, and it's only in, uh, in a sort of recent memory that it has come back onto the ban list. Wavering Eyes again was one of the best cards at the time premiering, definitely being able to just kill pendulums as you destroy the pendulum scales and yeah it got limited and got banned at one point I believe. No I think got limited and then later on was released from limited status. And I believe Retaliating C at the time was pretty good in just stopping fusions. It was a shifter, you know, Dimension Shifter without shifter. So it was a really good and spicy card and definitely had a lot of uh, potential in the game at the time. It wasn't used as much, but it was one of those cards that when it was able to be used, it would essentially win you the game. Um, these three wild cards were pivotal in this tier zero format that we had entered for, into Yu-Gi-Oh at that time. So that's something you need to bear in mind. And finally, we will talk about at this time, the Brilliant Package engine. Indeed, Brilliant Package Gem Knight premiered in this set and Brilliant Fusion premiered. Okay, this was the first time we would see what is what I what we call today as an engine, right? Are uh, the the Predator Plant Scorpio line that you know we've come to know all this time came from this package. Um, this was in Yu-Gi-Oh. Did we have engines before? Of course we did, but these engines were usually not really engines per se. But they were just part of decks. They were just part of things that skillful players did in tournaments. That you'd see, you'd see these cards in lists. But it wasn't the same strategy. It wasn't the same thing that you'd see over and over again. It was the brilliant package with brilliant fusion that really introduced an engine which became popularized and was 
everywhere in Yu-Gi-Oh. So what is the Brilliant Package? The Brilliant Package is essentially being adding dub, uh, double summon to every single deck. And this package was so famous that one of the cards that was used for this package called Gem Knight Garnet and is a term we use to this day. A Garnet in the package was basically the dead card you never wanted to draw as part of the Brilliant Fusion since it was a continuous spell. So the Gem Knight Garnet was a card you never wanted to draw as it would interrupt or dislodge your Brilliant Package combo. This term of Garnet now is now something we use in the community to this day. And in fact, it's part of Yu-Gi-Oh! vocabulary. And also, fun fact, it's part of the first uh, new vocabulary that was created by the players and is added, and has been added to Yu-Gi-Oh! vocabulary. Definitely the first Yu-Gi-Oh! vocabulary created for the game and has been added to the Yu-Gi-Oh! vernacular that we hear now today. As uh, to did you draw a garnet? Meaning, did you did you have a bad card that's part of your engine or part of your package? So that's definitely something that's very important that we got introduced to the most famous engine of all time, the brilliant package engine. Okay, let's move on to the next side of things. Value card, Ignister Prominence, the Blasting Draco Slayer. Indeed. It is this card that was worth a lot of money at this time, being released in this time. Um, why was this card worth a lot? Well, first of all, it was one of the few cards, I think it was one of the first cards we have in the game, one of the first monsters in the game that could shuffle a card from the field into the, into the deck. You have to remember at this time, shuff, uh you know a card that could not that could shuffle a card from from the opponent's field into the deck was unheard of as shuffling meant it did not target we had cards in Yu-Gi-Oh that shuffled cards don't get it twisted but a card that could shuffle a card from on your opponent's field to their deck without targeting well this that was unheard of um and is one of the first shuffling uh, first, uh, first, like, shuffling removal we've had in the game that doesn't have target into it. The only other card we had that could shuffle was um, Rainbow Neos, right? That was the only other card that we had that could shuffle cards, monster uh, cards or spells onto the field. But however, this shuffled a lot of cards. We didn't have a sh uh, an effect in the game that could shuffle just a singular card without targeting. Neos shuffled loads of cards, shuffled, you know, a bunch of monsters or spells and traps your opponent controls or cards in your opponent's graveyard, but it didn't shuffle a singular card. Sometimes you just needed just a singular form of removal. And this is where Ignista Prominence comes in, being one of the only cards in the game at this point in time to have this ability, hence why it was so expensive and hence why it had a lot of value. So that's something we got to, you got to take into consideration. Let's move on. So what is the value of this set? Well, grading this set and everything involved, it is S tier. That's an amazing grade. Um, there's just something about this set that's just oh so good at the time of its release in August 6th, 2015. Yes, it did introduce tier zero into the game and that terminology. It introduced the best engine of all time, which is the brilliant package uh, engine, brilliant fusion engine. Introducing a new term, new Yu-Gi-Oh vernacular or new Yu-Gi-Oh word, which is Garnet, right? It is part of the Yu-Gi-Oh terminology, part of the Yu-Gi-Oh vernacular that we use to this very day. And definitely, if for anyone who is a fan of this game or just wants to go back and to play um, Yu-Gi-Oh! and to understand power creep to its finest, to where Yu-Gi-Oh! has just gone to absolutely ridiculous degrees, this is the set that introduced the most broken things that we know Yu-Gi-Oh! for today. 
if the set of Gladiator Beast introduced um, just this uh, effects and how we utilize them, it is this set that introduced Tier Zero and the absolute absurdity and power creep of Yu-Gi-Oh that we have today. So this set is very important for anyone who's playing Yu-Gi-Oh, wants to get into Yu-Gi-Oh, because it is from this set, it is from 2015, that the power level and of Yu-Gi-Oh just essentially jumped off a cliff at this point. It was from this starting point that a lot of things in Yu-Gi-Oh started to become absolutely ridiculous. In terms of effects, in terms of playability, and in terms of like archetypes that we'll be getting from this point onwards. Their power level and scaling would just keep on increasing and and the effects would just keep getting more ridiculous as time went on. It never slowed down at this point. This was where it started. And if you if you ever want if you ever want to pinpoint a point where Yu-Gi-Oh just fell off a cliff in terms of like effects being getting completely out of control this is the point because this was the point where things were just absolutely crazy we have tier zero introduced to us the following year after we have Cleese coming into coming into the game that introduce you know the asp the the introduction of a boss monster um the feeling of oppression we have the fact that we start introducing uh, you know the years after you know effects that just say no and you start to see the power creep just keeps increasing more and more just like a bubbling inferno and it just doesn't stop so definitely that's something i would like to say here something i'd like to highlight here that August 6, 2015, we can say is the beginning of the end of, of slow Yu-Gi-Oh. It is, it is at this date of August 6, 2015, that fast Yu-Gi-Oh was introduced into the game. The speed of Yu-Gi-Oh was inevitably increased, and from that point on, and from this point on, Yu-Gi-Oh has never slowed down. That's all I've got to say at this point, and that's part of Yu-Gi-Oh! history. So, tune in next time where we'll talk about other historic sets and how they've impacted uh, the game. Hope to see you soon. We come to the end of this video. So, as I like to say, you are one step closer to becoming a Yu-Gi-Oh! Master. My fate, right, is in your hands.